How many of you guys have heard this story before? The brave knight defeated the fire-breathing dragon. He rode off with the beautiful princess, and they lived happily ever after. You guys heard that you guys kind heard of story stuff before? Like that? Yeah. Yep. But is it true? I mean, are dragons nothing more than just the stuff of fables, buddy? Hey, you know what? The Bible talks about dragons, mm -hmm. and that right there should grab people's attention. It actually talks about dragons significantly in the Old Testament, not just one book, but all over throughout the Old Testament. So when the Bible speaks of a creature as being a real creature, we need to take notice. That's right. So let's dive into this. Let's jump into dragons. Let's look at them in a little bit more detail. Yes, yeah, so let's start off here, buddy. Why do so many people in our culture today believe dragons are just mere fantasy? Where is that coming from? I think the primary reason is we don't find them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's happened over and over again. When you look historically, if people couldn't find anything, they just thought, oh, well, it's a myth. Yeah. And, you know, we started to see trends like this. For, for example, there was the dodo bird. Okay, dodo is something I used to think you call your brother. Yeah, you dodo bird. Um, but there, there's a bird, right? And there's these ancient accounts where people would see these dodos. These sailors would stop by mm -hmm. uh, and uh, kill them, harvest them for meat and take off. And mm -hmm. so there's all these accounts of it. But when people started showing up there later on, they're like, we don't see any. Yeah, a few hundred years ago, they thought the dodo bird was a was myth because, number one, they were strange creatures. Number two, no one could find them. And number three, they only existed in these old stories and drawings. Kind of sound familiar? Does it kind right. of parallel the dragons? So for a long time, scientists were saying dodos are a myth until mm -hmm. they found a specimen that had been stuffed and put in a museum. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, wow, it was real. And now, of course, they found some fossil evidence of it and so forth. So we need to be very careful of jumping into that. And what happened back in the day, you know, think uh, 15, 16, 1700s, a lot of the world wasn't discovered. We were still discovering places and finding places. And so if you didn't happen to find a creature in one place, you just assumed it was living somewhere else. This idea that they had gone extinct was just, who would have thought it? Yeah, Nobody you think about like that. elephants and rhinos. Like what, what would happen if they were to go extinct today? I mean, maybe 100 years, 200 years from now, they could also have that same logic and say, well, same problem. I guess they were a myth. But right. if, if it wasn't for all of our uh, restrictions and Endangered Species Acts, Elephants would probably go extinct as they well, and they'd just be doomed to, to repeat the same mistake over and over again. Yeah, so dragons, dinosaurs and dragons, uh, there's actually a connection between the two. Mm -hmm. And I want people to understand the word dinosaur is a new word. Do you remember what year it was that it was invented? 1841. 1841. So Richard Owen came up with this term. It means a uh, terrible or terrifying lizard. Mm -hmm. So we start digging up all these dinosaur bones, and we start calling them dinosaurs, and we disconnected them from being dragon bones. Yeah. Because during this time, from about the 1500s to the 1800s, we really weren't finding too many dinosaur-like, dragon-like creatures. Yeah, the bottom line they here, the belief that out. dragons are a myth is actually a modern idea. It was invented after they went extinct. I mean, up until the 20th century, I mean, it was essentially, they were real creatures. I mean, think about from uh, 1902 here, the Encyclopedia Britannica said that dragons might still exist, yet their numbers are few. And then just eight years later in 1910, all of a sudden the Encyclopedia Britannica published that dragons were myth. And the reason that they published that is someone said there were still some dragons living up in the Alps. That's a mountain range over in Europe. A guy I went up there, he couldn't find them, so he said, well, therefore, they're a myth. You see, even then, people were struggling with this idea that things could go extinct. Now, in the 1800s, people were entertaining that idea, but it really wasn't super common at that particular point. We're starting to see it more and more as people started to dive into these ideas and look at fossils. And, and so we'll forth. dive into it more, but really, I, I would say the main reason why is because our culture has been heavily influenced by the evolutionary worldview, really by that religion of secular humanism. Even in our church today, so many Christians are buying into that evolutionary worldview. And the evolutionary worldview, you know, obviously, obviously dinosaurs live with humans doesn't quite fit their timeline because dinosaurs went extinct millions of years ago. Yeah. So when they hear these legends, they say it's impossible. It can't be because it doesn't fit their timeline. Right. Even though those are right there listed with all these other creatures, mm -hmm. um, it's not just you know from the Bible. We also see it from ancient commentaries, ancient historians, ancient scientists, and mm -hmm. so forth. So we actually have uh, quite a few accounts of these sorts of creatures. They just weren't called dinosaurs. They were called dragons. Yeah. But let's look at this from a biblical viewpoint. Let's just step back and start. You go back to the Bible. Dinosaurs, which by definition are actually land animals. Now, I know so there's flying reptiles and sea reptiles. They're not actually technically considered dinosaurs. They would have been made on day five of creation. Dinosaurs would have been made on day six of creation. What day was man created? Do you guys remember? Day six. There you go. So, we got smart kids here today. So man and dinosaurs, which yeah. dinosaurs are a subset of dragons. Dragon is more of an overarching term. Mm -hmm. It included dinosaurs, but it also included other creatures. But they would have been living at the same time. Mm -hmm. So when we start with the Bible, it makes sense that they were living at the same time. Yeah. And it was a perfect world. Everything was perfect originally. That's what we expected from a perfect God. But then when Adam and Eve sinned and everything fell into sin, 
guess what? We started to see some animals turn. Mm -hmm. They start to become bad. They're meat-eating and things like that. Originally, all the animals and man were vegetarian, according to Genesis 129 and 30. So some of these animals were eaten. Some of them were very vicious. Mm -hmm. Then we see the flood. The flood of Noah's day. Hey, were dinosaurs and dragon-like creatures, uh, were, uh, were they on the ark? What do you think? They were, because remember, what did the Genesis 6 say? That every single pair of land animal, every kind of land animal had to go onto the ark. So obviously, right. they had to include dinosaur kinds. So, so you see from the biblical worldview, remember as Christians, we got to always start all of our thinking mm -hmm. based on God's word. We got to have our worldview based on the founded solid rock of God's word. And when we do, it's no surprise that there are accounts of dragons living among men. And that's it's what consistent we expected. with the Bible. They come off the ark. They go all over the place. We expect yeah. to see these accounts. They've legends. been coming off the ark. They've been dying ever since. So They've been again, dying ever um, since. So, of course, man lived among these awesome creatures from the very beginning. Day five, he made the flying and sea creatures, which included the pterodactyl and the plesiosaur kind, mm -hmm. which we would call dinosaurs today. And then, like Bodhi said, day six, God made all the land animals, which included the dinosaurs mm -hmm. and all the other land dragons. The same day, he created man. And then they went onto the ark. And then most of them got got uh, flooded away, though. They, um, That's right. That's what... You know, the bones we find in the ground, you know, these different fossils and these dinosaur graveyards, for example, mm -hmm. that's a record from the flood of Noah's day. Mm -hmm. And that's actually in conflict with what the world says. The world assumes that these rock layers were laid down slowly and gradually mm -hmm. over millions and billions of years. They assume there were no major catastrophes like a global flood that laid down those rock layers. But when we start with the Bible, there's a global mm -hmm. flood. Everything under the whole heavens was covered with water. It laid down the vast majority of those rock layers quickly over the course of about a year. That's right. Now, of course, we've had rock layers since then, but most are from the flood of Noah's day. Same evidence. Mm -hmm. We find dinosaurs in three of those rock layers. Boom. Yeah, the so flood. they were found in the, what, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And what's Correct. the reason why we only find those dinosaur bones mainly in those three strata? Buddy. Well, you got to understand the way that they define some of these rock layers. Uh, a rock layer is defined by what they find in it, and they, they have different index fossils, and if you find one of those index fossils, and it's in one of those rock layers, that's what defines it. So let's say you have a rock layer that's not one of the dinosaur rock layers, like a Permian rock layer, for example, which is lower than where the three dinosaur rock layers are. So let's say you're looking in there, and all of a sudden you find a dinosaur. Guess what happens? They redefine that rock layer to be one of those three dinosaur rock layers. You see, so it's kind of arbitrary the mm -hmm. way that they do some of that. So we do have to be careful. And I believe that. you also have a chapter in this book here called Dinosaurs, Dragons, and the Bible just came out by this guy, Bodhi Hodge. I believe it's uh, one of the chapters actually talks about that. So if you guys want to dive more into yeah. those details there. But in terms of um, those fossils, obviously the, uh, most of the fossils that we see around this is the graveyard of the flood that happened 4,300 years ago. But what's the reason why we don't find humans, for example, with dinosaurs? What's the quick answer to that? Well, there, there's a number of factors, but they probably weren't living in the same place. You know, like, what are the odds, if there was a global flood today, what are the odds you and a lion are going to get buried together? It's probably not going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Plus, there wasn't a whole lot of people. We sometimes think, oh, wow, so the world was populated like it is today. No, it really wasn't. There was only 10 generations from Adam to Noah. That's it, just 10 generations. So, I mean, you could potentially get up, you know, a few million people. But you also have to think, 120 years before the, low, uh, the, before the flood, God said, hold it, the earth is violent. Every thought is evil all the time. Think of this. If the entire world was that evil and that terrible and that violent, and they're all murderers, the population of the earth cuts in half in one day. You know, how many people were actually there by the time the flood actually hit? Probably wasn't a whole lot of people anyway. Yeah. So. yeah. And plus, by that logical thinking, a lot of evolutionists say, you know, because we don't find humans alongside dinosaurs, therefore, they couldn't have lived together. But obviously, if you think about it, that's a logical fallacy there. I mean, obviously, we don't find crocodiles buried with humans. Do they ever say that crocodiles and humans didn't live together? No, exactly. So or coelacanths. That. That's another one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, th these are called, you know, once of living fossils, mm -hmm. but, you know, we've lived at the same time. Just because you see certain things in the fossil record isn't necessarily an indication whether they live together or not. Yeah, if you guys want more details, check out Bodhi's book. There's a chapter on that. talks a little bit more about those details there. Dinosaurs, but let's, dragons, Let's, let's go back to the Bible real quick okay. here. So, in terms of the Bible here, why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible, Bodhi? Well, like we said, the word dinosaur is a new word. 
Prior to 1841, they would have been known as a different creature. They would have been called dragons. And in fact, a lot of our early translations of the Bible into English were in the 15 and 1600s. You might think of the Geneva Bible Mm -hmm. that the pilgrims write over that was Mm -hmm. done in the 1500s. Tyndale, Mm -hmm. there was the Coverdale, the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible. And people are arguing over which Bible. And so what they did is they came together and they got a standardized translation, which we call the King James. Uh, 1611, of course, has gone through a number of revisions. But most of our modern translations, one way or another, still have roots and ties back to the King James. So right. it makes sense why we don't find it in there because the, the Bible was essentially translated before the word even existed. Yeah, you kids have any guesses on where dragons are mentioned in the Bible? Any guesses here? Job. That's right, Job. Job 4, he talks about the behemoth, right? Sort of like a sauropod or a giant brachiosaurus as well as Job 41 talks about the Leviathan, right? right? Leviathan's the fire-breathing called Leviathan. Leviathan. He's called a dragon there. Yeah. Maybe like a chronosaurus or something similar to that. And the Hebrew word there is called tannin or tannin-im, which means serpent, dragon, or sea monster based on the context. It's not just in Job, but it's in Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Psalms, Isaiah. That's just the name of few. It's all over yeah. the Old Testament. Right. We find that word in there. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, though. When we look at modern translations, uh, we don't even find the word dragon yeah. sometimes, which yeah. is very odd. Why You'll is You'll see that? it in a metaphorical sense. There was a big shift in the 1800s, particularly the late 1800s, where people said, hey, maybe if these dragons are a myth, which was the idea floating around mm-hmm. out there, well, then they can't be real creatures, so we shouldn't translate this as dragon. We should translate it to something else. And then there's this little lull period in there where they didn't know what to translate it as. So they're translating it as palm trees and all sorts of creatures. Creatures and, and things like that. And you're like, what are they doing? And then a lot of them actually settled on jackals, even though there's another Hebrew word for jackal yeah. that is used in the Bible. But uh, that was actually a very odd shift. And we're just now starting to see people say, hey, maybe we should go back here and reevaluate this. More even properly. if you read some of the footnotes nowadays, the behemoth is maybe an elephant or a rhino or a hippo or something like that. But those, those things have tails like a cedar tree, right? Yeah. The elephant and the. Yeah, their the description <laughs> doesn't match, do they? <laughs> No, they really don't. Uh, you know, when you actually look at the description given for something like a Leviathan or something mm-hmm. like the behemoth, they just don't match our modern creatures, whether it's an elephant, whether it's a hippo, uh, or in the situation of a Leviathan, it doesn't match a crocodile. You know, for example, this Leviathan, you could not pierce it with darts or arrows, and mm-hmm. yet a crocodile could be shot with an arrow. And God gives a lot um, of detail in terms of mm-hmm. like what the behemoth was, what right. the Leviathan was, and he mentions it along all of these other real creatures. So obviously it's, mm-hmm. it doesn't make sense for God to all of a sudden switch to a mythological creature in between that sentence right. there. So obviously it had to be a real creature. You know what else we find? We find a lot of evidence of man and dinosaurs living at the same time. That's, that's right. not necessarily just from the Bible either. Yeah. Even though we have plenty of examples, you know, if it's in the Bible, of course, that's, that, that means it's true. But we find a lot of confirmational evidence of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, these would be like petroglyphs and cave drawings mm-hmm. and etchings and things like that in various parts of the world. And I actually like studying some of this. There's yeah. whole books that's been written on it. Of course, I have a chapter in the book. Yeah, we that, have a chapter on that. Virtually every single continent around the world, there's examples of paintings of walls, uh, pottery, textiles, petroglyphs, those ancient artwork of dragons. But are those for real? Yeah, and and they're right alongside creatures you'd readily recognize. For example, Bishop Bell uh, died around the year 1500. He's buried in a church there in England. And aren't you guys glad we don't bury people in the church nowadays? You know, I remember when I was over in England, you know, I'd be walking around in these churches and I'm like walking on all the graves. I'm like, I just don't feel right about this. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bishop Bell died there and he's got a brassing that goes along the outside that kind of outlines where his grave is right there. And uh, they have a rug over it now, but w- when you're there, uh, if, you, if you pull that back, you can see on this brassing, there's all sorts of little animals, and you're like, oh, I, I know that one. Yep, I know that one. I know. That one looks like a dinosaur. That one looks like a dinosaur. You know, so you see these dinosaur dragon-looking creatures right there. And, you know, that's just one of many examples. Mm -hmm. And that's in the 1500s. Yeah, there's several examples in both these books, so make sure you guys check it out. But just as a flavor here, I mean, there was a petroglyph by the Anasazi natives. looks strikingly like a sauropod dinosaur. In other words, a dragon. There's a pictograph made by Native Americans in Utah of a flying dragon. Kind of looks like a pterosaur. Uh, There's even a wall-mounted scripture. I think this one's amazing. In Cambodia of a dragon that looks like a stegosaurus. Looks like a stegosaurus. Yeah, kind of muscle. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah just, just the picture right there. Plus, yeah. there's paintings in Australia by the aborigines of a water dragon. kind of looks like a plesiosaur, and on and on it goes. Plus, there's yeah. even flags. There's banners. I mean, just look at the Welsh flag today. Mm-hmm. Look at the Imperial China flag today. There's dragons on these flags. So, obviously, people for a long time believed that these were real creatures. Right. Uh, let, let me explain something for just a moment. The word dragon... 
uh, you know, what's the equivalent, uh, you know, of what we're actually talking about here? You know, is, is dinosaurs and dragons basically just the same thing? No, dragon is more of an overarching term. It included the dinosaurs, but it also includes the flying reptiles. A lot of the sea reptiles, think of like a plesiosaur, for example, or chronosaurus uh, kind of thing. It would even include large serpentine snake-like creatures or even things like crocodiles and alligators. Mm -hmm. By technical definition, they would actually fit under this auspice of being a dragon. So sometimes when I see the word dragon, it's like, well, now let me look at the context. Is this a flying dragon, a sea dragon, or a land dragon? If it's a land dragon, then I'm like, oh, okay, well, uh, is this particularly a dinosaur? See, dinosaurs actually have a unique definition too. A lot of people don't realize that. A, a dinosaur is defined by its hip structures. It's got one of two hip structures so that it raises its body up off the mm -hmm. ground. That's why something like a crocodile or an alligator or a Komodo dragon, they're not, they're not considered uh, dinosaurs because their hip structures have their, their legs belly, coming yeah. out to the side. Mm -hmm. That's called sprawling, mm -hmm. and their belly rests on the ground. Exactly. But let me ask you this, buddy. So maybe... Um, is it possible these ancient people just dug up these, these ancient dinosaur bones? Because we've been finding these dinosaur fossils for thousands of years. Is it possible they just dug up these bones and maybe interpreted what they could have looked like, and then that's what they painted on the walls? What do you think? You know, that's a common uh, excuse that I oftentimes hear from, say, the evolutionary side. Because, you know, in the secular world, they have man and dinosaurs separated out by 65, 66 million mm -hmm. years. So they're, in their mindset, man could never have seen a dinosaur to get these petroglyphs or to get these different... Uh, uh, descriptions of, of uh, dragon-like, dinosaur-like creatures. So they have to try to come up with something. So their, their best bet is, hey, here's some fossils. Let's pull it out. Let's put them together. And mm -hmm. let's, wow, maybe this is a dragon. Uh, you know, that's a common uh, thing that I get. But you know what? Very few people actually pulled those bones out, put them all together, and actually right. did some sort of yep. study to get exactly. that far. You know, they might have found a big bone, but they didn't even know what that bone was. It comes from the misconception that when we find a fossil, all of a sudden we got the huge whole structure together, you know, with the tail and the mm -hmm. head and arms. Obviously, no, we don't find that. We find right. little pieces here, little pieces there. Right. So, yeah. And even trying to say, you know, for example, I, I love this image sitting here behind us. Um, you know, we, we draw out dinosaurs, but we're doing that based on their bones. We don't actually know the color of many of these types of things. You know, we find some skin imprints. They were scaly creatures, for example. So we can find that. A lot of the old depictions of uh, dragons, for example, oftentimes had like dragon fuzz or something like that somewhere, or they were more streamlined to their body. We do a lot of guesswork when we put these together. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that people have done over the years, when they find a dinosaur, everybody wanted the biggest dinosaur. You'd make the news, oh, my T-Rex is bigger than your T-Rex. You know, I mean, that's what people were doing. They wanted them to be big and massive. So when they actually calculated out their body mass, they were using mammal type body mass calculations. And so you see these big, heavy uh, triceratops or big, heavy T-Rexes. But, you know, people started reevaluating this maybe 15, 20 years ago, started saying, hold it. These were reptilian-like creatures. Why not do a body mass more like a reptilian creature? When you do that, they actually seem a little more streamlined. If they did have dragon-like features, you could say, whoa, these really did match up fairly well. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I mean, there's even a lot of historical accounts of dragons. Let's, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about that as well in terms of, uh, for example, Pliny back in AD 70, he said Africa produces elephants, but it's India that produces the largest as well as the dragon. Even Aristotle, he said the dragon, mm -hmm. when it eats fruit, it swallows endive juice and it has been se seen in the act. Right. So, and we can keep going on and on and on. Yeah, from there. there's a number of them, Herodotus and others, you know, that had commented mm -hmm. on them. Uh, one of my favorites is about these winged snakes that would fly in from the marshes of yeah. Arabia toward uh, uh, Egypt. And the ibis birds, this is why the Egyptians yeah. loved the ibis birds. They would attack them and take their eggs and kill them and destroy mm -hmm. them, uh, you know, to stop them because they had this poison that was pretty, pretty vicious mm -hmm. on them. It'd burn Chapter them and, 22 and so forth. in this book, a lot of cool yeah. references here. For example, Herodotus, like we talked about, an ancient Greek writer, he records, there is a place in Arabia, modern Egypt, situated very near the city of Buto, to which I went on hearing of some winged serpents. And when I arrived there, I saw bones and spines of serpents in such quantities as, as it would be impossible to describe the form of the serpent is like that of the water snake, but he has wings without feathers and as like as possible to the wings of a bat. Kind of yeah. sound like a dragon to you guys? Yeah, and he's describing other animals at the same time if yeah, you actually read right. through all these contexts. Um, you know, what I found was fascinating was, you know, these uh, uh, creatures oftentimes lived in a swamp or a marsh. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, uh, those ones I just mentioned that were coming from Arabia, they said they were coming from the marshes. But you look in Arabia today, there isn't much for marshes or swamps. Now, we have evidence that 
the place used to be much more like that, and it's dried up. It's more desert. Um, but at the same time, we look at other parts of the world. We've drained a lot of swamps and, mm -hmm. and turned them into farm ground. We've destroyed marshes. A lot of them have dried out. I suggest that a lot of their habitat was really going away. And by the 15 to the 1800s, uh, you know, as we've really spread out to other places and destroyed a lot of that, we've destroyed a lot of their habitat. Mm -hmm. And that could be one of the reasons that the numbers have significantly declined. Yeah, so what are some of those reasons why? Let's, let's talk about that in terms of why they went extinct. Why don't we see them today anymore? Well, the number one reason, sin. Mm -hmm. We need to remember that. We need to look at the world from a biblical viewpoint. We are in a sin-cursed and broken world. And that's why, you know, God made the world perfect. It was very good according to Genesis 1.31. Deuteronomy 32.4 says every work of God is perfect. Mm -hmm. That's what we expected from a perfect God. But we're not in a perfect world anymore. We were in a sin cursed and broken when when Adam and Eve sinned against God, God cursed the ground. He cursed the animals. He sentenced man to die. So we're in a world that's broken. And we see all sorts of animals dying out and going extinct. Dinosaur, dragon-like creatures, mm -hmm. they're no exception. Yep. Uh, that We've just seen them in whole categories. But, uh, you know, you mentioned the endangered species list before. I mean, imagine how many creatures today would have went extinct if we wouldn't have enacted that. We'd probably be wondering if there's any big cats like lions and cheetahs mm -hmm. and tigers or elephants or condors or eagles. I mean, a lot of those things, we might be sitting around wondering if they're a myth. Yeah, exactly. And so there's also those environmental factors because after the ark, after the global flood, there was an ice age. Reptiles usually don't do well in those kind of environments. Exactly. There's lots of diseases. Plus, they were probably hunted by a man. You think about every single dragon legend. What happens at the end of these dragon legends? Usually a dinosaur gets killed. Yeah, usually they did. So could have been hunted what, by one of the most famous. And okay, what, what is the most famous dragon account? Do you know who it was? Do you remember? St. George. St. George. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, St. George is the patron saint of England. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Sweden, I went to Gomelistan, the old town, and they had this big statue of St. George slaying the dragon. Uh, St. George was actually a Christian, but he was a Roman soldier about A.D. 300, and he was stationed in North Africa. And apparently in North Africa, there was this village that was being attacked by this dragon living out of this marsh, out of this swamp. And it would come out and it would, it, it would attack. So what they decided to do is say, hey, let's feed it some sheep. Some sheep. So yep. they started taking yep. a couple of sheep out to it and they'd come out and start eating all the sheep. And well, it got bigger and they ran out of sheep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it started terrorizing again. They're like, oh no. Well, we got to understand this was a pagan culture. And they're like, oh no. So, so they said, we need to appease our gods. Maybe we need to do human sacrifice to this dragon. Maybe that'll appease them. And so they started casting lots. Think of like rolling dice. And they'd narrow it down. Finally, somebody was taken out and they were sacrificing people to this dragon. They'd go out and tie him to a stake. Mm -hmm. So they cast lots one day and lo and behold, it fell on the king's daughter. King didn't like that. He wanted somebody else to take the place. Guess what? No one volunteered for that job. I don't think so I there she was tied to a stake. That's when St. George happened by. Mm -hmm. And uh, this dragon came out. He, he lanced it. He speared it. He didn't kill it, though. He actually tied it up, dragged it back to the village, and slayed it in front of everyone to mm -hmm. show everybody it was just an animal. So he rescued the princess. And what did he want in, in, in return for all of those uh, valiant efforts? He just wanted to be able to preach Christianity. Yeah, amen for that. I, See, I, I, According to the account, they said the entire village gave their lives to the Lord. And it was no small village, by the way, if you mm -hmm. look at uh, ancient standards. Yeah, the king was willing to give up half of his kingdom for this guy. And he's like, no, I don't want any of it. I just want to preach the good news of Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Now, Rome didn't like that. Rome actually wanted him to recant his Christianity. He wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to cut the story short, they actually put St. George to death. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Plus, there's lots of other dragon slayers in history. I mean, you guys mm -hmm. got guys like St. Sylvester, Sigurd, mm -hmm. Beowulf, Tristan, Martha, even the yep. apostles, Philip and Barnabas, even in the first yes. century, they, they have a recorded an encounter, yeah. encounter as well. So we see quite a bit of that kind of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when it comes to dinosaurs and dragons, I think, you know, when we step back and we start with the Bible, it makes sense of dinosaurs. It makes sense of dragons and these accounts. Uh, especially in the sin, cursed, and broken world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, o on and on, again and again, from the biblical worldview, mm -hmm. it makes sense that we would have all of these historical accounts of man living with dragons, living with dinosaurs. But again, from the evolutionary worldview, it doesn't make sense because they believe dinosaurs died out 60 to 65 yeah. million years ago. That's why it's so important as Christians, we get back to having the right Christian worldview that's built on the solid rock of God's word. And when we do, it's a great confirmation of what scripture says. Yeah. Yeah, so I absolutely loved doing this book. I actually spent five years working on this book. And I tried to write it in such a way that most people could read it. 
Um, I tried to shoot for, say, a junior high level. And uh, with that, I mean, smart juniors would have no problem reading this book. Um, adults shouldn't have a problem diving into it. There's a few sections that are more semi-technical, jump up. But I'd say, by and large, most people can grab this book and read it. You can right say there. he gets pretty fired up about this topic. That's right. Get fired, fired up. I wasn't dragging my feet on this <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, I heard really good that uh, dragon pun the other day, Bo. It was so good, it just flew over my head. No? No? <laughs> That's a good one. I'll give you that one. <laughs> but <laughs> really, okay, Bodhi, but huge fire-breathing creatures, really, I mean, come on. God would never create a fire-breathing creature, right? Boy, I've heard that one for years. Okay, I love it, but not just, you know, like a Leviathan was considered fire-breathing, you know, when you re read the context in Job mm -hmm. 1. Um, but you also see fiery serpents back in the books of Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, you also see the fiery flying serpent uh, in the book of Isaiah. So, I mean, there were creatures that were doing this sort of thing, but we're in a culture today that would deny such a thing could happen. And yet, there's a little bug called a bombardier beetle, mm. bombardier beetle, some people call it. This little beetle takes two chemicals, shoots it into a chamber in its hind end, and shoots it out, fires it out, it ignites. Psh, and uh, it's not the kind of fire that's going to burn your village down, but it will burn you. You can hear it when this thing goes off. You're like, whoa, what was that? Um, and it's got incredible aim. You know, it's an insect. You know, it moves its legs and shoots in all these different directions. Um, I saw a video of this one time uh, where this ant came up, and it, it just just burnt this ant. It was or a amazing. Spider. I've seen this spider, too, and the so, spider wasn't too happy about that. Oh, my. It's amazing. Okay, I'm not a fan of bugs, but this has got to be the coolest bug Yeah, well, planet. like 212 degrees coming out, so, oh, I mean, yeah. that's, that stuff will burn you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an amazing shot. So, you know what, if the Lord could do this with a bug, could he do something like this with a Leviathan or some yeah. of these fire serpents? Of course he could. This is not a problem from a biblical view. And we also see in God's word, like you were saying, Isaiah uh, chapter 30, verse 6 says this, the burden against the beasts of the south through a land of trouble and anguish from which came the lioness and lion, the viper and the fiery mm -hmm. flying serpent. So you see along with all of those other real animals, it says they will carry their riches on the backs of young donkeys and their treasures of the humps of camel to a people who shall not profit. So you see over and over again, it talks about these flying fiery serpents. Now, a lot of the mm -hmm. times you read the footnotes, they'll say, well, maybe it was a flying snake or a flying viper, but obviously that doesn't make sense because right. it just mentioned viper right before that. Right. So obviously that's, that's not one of them. Right. But again, I mean, is it really that far-fetched to think of a fire-breathing dragon? No, it's really not. Yeah. It actually makes sense. This, this isn't a problem. Now, yeah. what, can we actually name which specific dinosaur or which type of creature it was? Not exactly. Um, you know, like I said, we, we dig up bones and sometimes they're partials and, you know, we build these mm -hmm. skeletons. Um, but, you know, some of these other features, some of the fleshly features, it's tough to actually determine mm -hmm. what was what. On so not those. every dragon likely breathed fire, but maybe some of them did. Right. So that's, that's, that's what we can mm -hmm. say there. Let's go back to the Bible, though, real quick here. Let's do it. There really is a dragon still roaming today, the deadly dragon, which is our enemy. Right. We're talking about Satan here. Mm -hmm. Satan is equated with a great dragon in the book of Revelation. Revelation and I, think I think there's a good reason for it mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of these uh, old ancient dragon accounts, you know, these dragons were pretty vicious. So Satan's pretty vicious. He is out there. Now I've had people say, oh, well, we don't want to talk about dragons because, boy, that's associated with Satan. But at the same time, he also prowls around mm -hmm. like a roaring lion. Uh, you know, he's been compared to other, other things as right. well. So we have to be very careful of that. We're talking about the dragon-like animal creatures. And yes, Satan is compared to being a, a dragon in that spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a good reason for that. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 11:3, 3, the Apostle Paul says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So you see, back to the, to back to the beginning, Genesis mm -hmm. chapter 3, Satan deceived Eve in the garden, which led to Adam's disobedience, yes. which brought death and sin into the world. And Satan is using the same tactic today, trying to get people to doubt the authority of God's word. He's using that same tactic over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Did God actually say? And that is the serpent that we have to deal with today. That is the real dragon, the real enemy. Satan wants people to believe that dragons were a myth, that were just poetry, that were just fables. And doubt really what it is, Bible. It's an attack yeah. on biblical authority. And that's why we're so passionate about it. That's right. We want to get people back to the Bible. I mean, here's Satan. Satan has been using the same method, just get you to deceive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he used a, a serpent. You know, I've had people say, well, was that a dragon? Was that a dinosaur? We, we really don't know. We know that that particular serpent was cursed or crawling its belly and eat dust. A lot of people think, oh, well, maybe it was a snake. Well, we don't know that it was a snake. You know, it, uh, you know, a lot of reptiles crawl on their belly and they still have legs and so forth. So we just don't know that, the answer to that. But the, the key is Satan is a master to get you to doubt. If he can get you to doubt one part of the Bible, guess what? That's going to open a door to 
get you to doubt other parts of the Bible. That's right. And I want people to understand from the first verse of the Bible to the last verse of the Bible, it is trustworthy. Now, I've had people say, oh, well, it, do you have to take every single thing in the Bible literally? No, it's not written that way. You take it the way it is written. If it is written as uh, uh, literal history, you take it as literal history. If it's written as poetry, you take it as poetry. If it's written as a song, take it as a song. Take the metaphors as metaphors and so forth. Take it plainly. Take Read it the it way it's written. Yep, exactly. Because the thing is, if we can't trust Genesis 1-1 to be true, why trust John 3-16? Why trust any of the Bible to be true? And so really, um, it goes back to the Bible. It goes back to God's infallible word. And that's why as Christians, we got to go back to trusting God's infallible word over man's fallible opinions, man's ideas out there. And when we start with the Bible, we, we know that we cannot defeat this dragon on our own. No, but this is where we can rest assured, Christ mm -hmm. Christ has re uh, saved us from that dragon. Yep. Here, when Christ died on the cross, the infinite Son of God took the infinite punishment from the infinite Father. And that was enough to satisfy God's wrath upon sin. When we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, His perfection, His righteousness is transferred to us. That's called imputation. It's imputed to mm -hmm. us so that we're seen as spotless on judgment day. Going back to Matthew 12, 29 here, really we needed Jesus, the stronger man, to conquer Satan. For those in Christ, one can have victory over the great dragon. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says this, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And going back to Genesis 3.15, we needed Jesus to crush the head of the serpent. And that's exactly what he did on the cross. He did that. He defeated, he destroyed the works of the mm -hmm. devil, is what it right. says. So we can rest assured in that. Yeah, so I want to encourage each one of you, always be prepared to give an answer. That's 1 Peter 3.15. Uh, it doesn't say always go give that answer. There's a time to, to not cast pearls before swine, but do it with gentleness, do it with respect. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Yeah. And that's what we need to do. We need to be careful what the world is saying. Always test it and compare it to the word of God because God is the one who's always right.